Hey guys, I am back with another video. I was thinking about what I wanted to film and I haven't done a Q&A in a pretty long while, so I figured why not, I'm gonna do a Q&A. So I went on Twitter, sent out a little tweet, said ask me a question and I'm gonna answer it in this video. Um, so I am going to get started with answering my questions. It's a little bit cold and I am in my kitchen and I decided I was gonna have hot chocolate because I'm freezing. It's the north. I'm from the south, so I'm just gonna throw that out there. Okay, moving on to more important things. The first question is, what was the best experience you've ever had while teaching? That's really, really hard to answer, I feel like, because there are lots of really great things from, like in kindergarten when you had all the hugs, and even now, like I have kids who will just want to give me a random hug. And then like boys who are, you know, at that age that they're like, they're trying to be cool, but they're still really young and that kind of thing. So like they'll even go and give you a hug and that kind of makes you think, oh, okay, they really do like me. And um, times when, you know, kids who are just really, really struggling and they're not getting it and then they're finally getting it at some point or another and you're feeling this like, yes, I finally got through to them. Like those are fantastic experiences. Those are all memories that I cherish very much with all of my students. So it's really hard to say that I have like one particular experience um, that was really amazing while teaching. So lots of different things are amazing when teaching. So when you taught kindergarten, did you use Lucy Calkins for your writing lessons? Um, yes and no. So can I just say that when I taught kindergarten, I had a love-hate relationship between me and Lucy. So um, Lucy Calkins, if you've ever heard about her writing, um, her writing went from like K to two second grade. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a kindergartner's writing and then a second grader's writing. It's extremely different. So it's hard to say that I could just flip up with open Lucy Calkins and say, okay, I'm, this is where I'm going to start. So I used her, but I used her sparingly. <laughs> I didn't use her all the time. I did go through and use one. It was a talking drawing writing book. I'll leave that down in the description box so you guys can go and check that one out. It is a fantastic book for writing in kindergarten. It had some really great mini lessons as far as where should you start with writing and how is it that, you know, how are you starting that that writing workshop model? Because in the beginning, it's a lot of talking. You can even take that up into third and fourth grade because they have to be able to communicate their writing before they can actually put it down on paper. If they can't tell you the story, they're not gonna be able to write the story. So talking, drawing, and writing did a lot of that. It had them go through that process of being able to share their writing, then it had them going through and drawing their experiences because it has to be able to match. That picture and the words need to be able to match. So it had them go through and actually draw their writing and then they started labeling it. So it was a really nice progression, especially for kindergarten. You could definitely use it in some of the other grades. So I will put that down below. But I am using Lucy Calkins now, again, sparingly. I, I have a love-hate relationship with Lucy. Like there are some things that I really, really like and then there are some things that I think that I've just kind of, um, come out with in my own with like my own beliefs on teaching so and I just kind of stick to those things because they've worked for me in the past so and I feel like a lot of other teachers will think the same way you know they've done things they'll take from here and there and they'll put it all together and make it work for them it's all about making your instruction work for you and for your students can you talk a little bit about your college experience and student teaching? So I did a video and it was the teach.com video and I'm gonna leave a link down to that so that you guys can go and check that out. And I talked a little bit about my student teaching and just kind of where, how I became a teacher. Um, but I was not a very good student when I was in high school. I was actually a really bad student. I barely almost graduated high school. Like it was pretty sad. When I first started college, I didn't go to my classes. I got zeros in all of my classes. Um, I just was not on the best path. And I had my son, who is my older son, Ian, had him and everything just kind of clicked. And it said, all right, I have got to stop doing what it is that I'm doing. I have to wake up and I need to get my life straight. 
So uh, I went back to school and I didn't really know what I wanted to be. Like I had changed my major so many times. Like I was in to be like a psychologist, a psychiatrist. Then I went to that from um, like interior design. And then I went into business for some reason. Like I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, but finally, my cousin who is teaching third with Mr. G on Instagram, um, was going in for teaching and I looked up to him so much um, for lots of different reasons. So I was talking to him one day and said, I really don't know what I want to do and he told me about teaching and I was like, maybe I could do that. I mean, that, that sounds kind of cool. I did like to like help others in like the restaurant business and I kind of taught them the ways of the restaurant and I, you know, I kind of looked over some of the different servers and um, kitchen cooks when I did work in a restaurant. So I did enjoy doing that and like helping and teaching and talking with other people and I said, let me try it. So I tried it and I fell in love with it. Um, I will say that I was a single mom. I was working a full-time job and I was going to school full-time. So it was hard. It was really hard. It was very stressful. I was very focused and I had to be focused. I didn't have a choice because if I wasn't, then I wasn't going to get my degree. Um, so I had no free time because it was between picking up my kid, going to work, going to school, studying for exams, that type of thing. But I was very, very dedicated. The program was phenomenal that I went to. Um, I loved the teachers. I loved talking with other people inside of the classes, but I was in that zone of I am here to be a professional and I'm not going to play around. So I wasn't much of a socializer in school. I didn't like to like hang out and talk with other people. People, if they were all about talking about school, I'm like, yeah, hey, I'm going to do that. I'm going to sit down and talk about education because that's what I was passionate about. I wanted to talk about education. So that was pretty much my my college and my student my student teaching. Let me tell you about that. I had a phenomenal teacher. Loved, loved, loved her. I will say that I cried all the time because it was very stressful and I wanted to be my absolute best. So I pushed myself to all limits. I remember waking up at and being at the school at 6 o'clock. I remember leaving the school about 6.30, 7 o'clock. I tried to be there all the time being the most creative, finding new ways to try things, showing the principal that I was above and beyond and could do other things that teachers were not doing yet. So I pushed myself to new limits and I worked really, really hard. I'm not going to say it wasn't easy because I was stressed the majority of the time. I did cry a lot. I was still trying to have a job. I probably that wasn't that great of a mother, but in my head I was like, okay, if I really work hard for this job that I really, really want, I can be a better mother because then I can provide for my son. So that was kind of my thinking. So there was a lot of like different things. It was difficult. Um, it was a great experience. I wouldn't change my experience for the life from for anything um, because I learned so much from it. So yeah, that was my that was my experience. Sorry if that's not exactly what you wanted to hear. <laughs> Okay, so um, what made you choose to do flexible seating? Um, <laughs> so I heard about flexible seating. It was something new that was coming up. You know, it was popping up on blogs. It was popping up on, on Instagram. And I am always that person that's like, oh, that's cool. Let's try it out. I mean, what's the worst that could possibly happen? I have to move it back. Not a big deal. I had heard about it and I said, I want to try flexible seating because I am one of those people that I do not like to work sitting at a desk. I do not like to read in the same spot constantly. Like I have to move around. I like to be spread out on the floor and all the, like everybody's learning styles and how they like to learn is very different. So I said, I'm going to try it. I'm going to do it, see what happens. So I jumped into it this year, brand new school, brand new grade level, brand new everything and said, I'm going to try this at the exact same time. Um, I know a lot of my viewers, if you have not been seeing some of my, my vlogs, um, there's been a vlog that's my past few vlogs that have been out. My classroom looks a little bit different. And I promise you that the next vlog that comes out I'm going to explain everything about that but I just I'm one of those people that likes to try different things see if it works out for me if it doesn't then I change it it's not a big deal it's not the end of the world um but yeah I thought it was a I thought it was a great idea I like the giving um students voice and choice over things and I felt like it was just something else that I could say hey I 
I respect you. I trust you. This is the choice and the, the you know, the choices that I'm going to let you make within this classroom. Um, and that was just one of the other many choices that they get to make was being able to choose where they wanted to sit and how they wanted to sit and having different choices for that seating. So that is kind of my whole reasoning for doing it. It's just because I thought it was cool and I wanted to try it out. So I did. Okay. Is it weird not having a smart board this year? No, it's not. Um, honestly, when I had a smart board, it worked really, really well in kindergarten. Um, if I was still in kindergarten, I may still want to have a smart board, but with the school that I'm in now, Everyone has one-to-one -one iPads, so a lot of the really cool, fun stuff that I can do, I, you know, I can do it through all these other apps that are out there. Um, so it's not really, and I don't really notice it, to be honest. It doesn't bother me. What kinds of methods do you use to make lessons activities accommodating for all types of learners? So I guess then, again, this is like you just really learning your students and getting to know them to the best. Um, because, you know, right now I have kids who have to have different types of paper because their handwriting is something that could, you know, bring people to tears. So giving kids different handwriting um, paper that could that's an accommodation that's something that could help them um, I have certain kids who are not able to you know complete out a certain type of writing so I may scaffold some of that writing for them I may start some of that writing for them it may be as simple as I may have kids come up to me and just start talking to me and then I take them through those processes um, together it again just depends on exactly what it is that your your students need um, so in reading, I have all kinds of differentiated leveled readers. So I will go online and some of the um, places, what are they? So News ELA is a really great one for informational articles that you can find. And then there's one more that I cannot remember for the love of me, but I will leave a link down to those. But those are free um, places that you can go and grab level text for your classroom. So that's something else that I do within kind of my reading block. I have some kids who are using some type of like the little highlighters, which again, I'll leave a link down below to that too. But there's little strip of highlighters that will help guide them as they're reading because some of the times when they're trying to read some of those chapter books, you know, there's just that text is so small and it's, it's hard for them to kind of keep track of where they are. So they use that. And, you know, I had a kid that just came up to me and said, hey, do you have one of those? Because she knew, she recognized that she needed it. So I took it out and let her use it. Um, so it just really depends on what exactly what it is that your kids need. What I would do is just kind of one day sit back and just kind of create a list of, okay, this student is struggling with this, they're struggling with this, and kind of write all those things down so that as you're doing some of your lessons and you're planning your lessons, if it if it's a writing lesson, you know you may be scaffolding it a little bit, giving them a different graphic organizer, giving them some type of a sentence starter, um, having them be able to work with a partner, just those types of things that will help them be successful in their work. Um, for reading, just using some of those levelized texts, giving them the opportunity to read to you a couple of times before they go back and actually work. So there's just lots of different things and if you want more about that, um, just let me know and I will try to do another video with some different accommodations and things like that that I do within my classroom. How do you respond to bad, disrespectful behavior in the classroom? Um, so I have had my few run-ins this year with um, an older grade level, which they are a little bit smart. You know, they're smarter than kindergarten. They are a little bit more aware of their behavior um, and they get a little bit sassier. <laughs> I mean, it's going to happen. So I've had my few run-ins with students who have either just been disrespectful to adults or they've made just wrong choices when it comes to things that they're doing within the classroom. Um, and I'm really big into building a community. So every day during my morning meeting, we are always doing something and working together as far as building community. Um, I will typically kind of pull them off to the side and say, listen, this is what we're doing. This is what I'm noticing. You tell me whether or not you think that this is appropriate. I always try to ask some type of a question and put it back on them and have them answer some of the questions. And I say, okay, well, what is it that you think that you should be doing right now? Well, how can you show me that you were going to do this? And I said, this is how, this is what I'm giving you as far as warnings go. 
this is how many more warnings I am going to give you after this and we're going to have to come up with a different solution. So I give them and tell them that, that, that they have cer certain warnings and then I tell them exactly how are we going to correct it, what are they going to show me that they can do because they know it, they know exactly what they're supposed to do but a lot of the time they're choosing not to make those choices. And if after a certain point they're continuing to do that, then I make other arrangements. I either call parents, I call, I send them to um, talk with a principal, and they know that at this point. And I say, listen, we have had plenty of opportunities since the beginning of the year. You've been in school for, I don't know, 60 days now. You are completely aware of what is it that is expected of you and how you should be acting within this classroom. And I am no longer going to give you, you know, 10, 12 chances. Really, you're going to get three. You're going to get three chances to correct that behavior. And if it's something that we're still struggling with, I'm either going to move you completely from where you are, or I'm going to move you outside, or I can find somewhere else for you to go, if that's the choices that you were going to make. So I make it very clear to them. I try to sit down with them, solve the, solve the problem, figuring out if there is something else that's going on. Because a lot of the times, if something is happening, there is something between friendships that are going on. I've noticed that in fourth grade, it's all about the 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 social aspect of it like it is there's always something going on between people within the classroom that you don't really know about but there are whispers happening you know you can see people giving other people glances so is that kind of behavior so having to figure that out and then I'll just pull them out and say hey let's fix it let's fix it right now let's throw it all out there let's not be shy we're gonna be here for quite some time together in this classroom so we need to fix this now so I throw it out there and then I'm done with it and I say you know what I'm not we're not gonna talk about it anymore this is a place where we are starting to, we're trying to learn this is not a place where we're trying to handle some of these these issues um, so I am very direct, I am very firm with them, but, and then I tell them I'm going to move on. I'm not going to sit there and waste my time, I'm not going to waste everyone else's time because that's not fair to them. They're here, they want to learn, you're not, so let's figure out what it, what it is that you want to do. And then I'm, I'm kind of, I move on. So um, again, we work really hard on building some of that community. And I really feel at this time of the year, now it's, you know, the 1st of November, I am noticing that they are really understanding that community building because they are cheering each other on. They are looking out for each other. You know, they will come and tell me that certain people are making bad choices, but they will say, hey, listen, I've tried to do this. I've tried to help them, but they're continuing to make those bad choices, which is like really surprising and really exciting for me because I'm like, yes. So all of this work that I've been putting in since the beginning of the year with these morning meetings, trying to build some of that community, it's finally starting to stick with them. You know, they're really trying to work together. We have some of those little mishaps every once in a while, but it is so low at this point that I don't, I mean, we don't see it as often as what we did at the very beginning of the year. So it's super exciting. Um, I would say definitely if you are having a lot of issues with behavior, try to think about what are some things that you can do with community building within your classroom. Check out the morning meeting book. I'm going to leave a link down to that um, responsive classroom as well. Leave a link as, to that book as well. Um, that's all about building that community um, within your classroom and building some of those relationships with your students. And once you've done that, I promise you will start to see some type of a difference. So if you're not already doing some type of a morning meeting and community building, definitely look into it and try to incorporate that into your classroom. Okay, what's your favorite memory this year as a new fourth grade teacher? Um, so this is like a two-part question. So my favorite memory is going to have to be Oh, that's hard. Okay, so I just had a pirate day and there was a little girl who, uh, and I think this is all pirate day to be honest. So um, there was a little girl that came in and she wrote, she was writing on the whiteboard because we typically have like whiteboard messages that they will go through and write off in the mornings. But we didn't have a question on the whiteboard that day. It was just kind of a directions of what they were supposed to be doing. But she started writing. We're like, what is she doing? Why is she writing on there? And we didn't really say anything. We're just kind of, it's my, we as my partner teacher. So we're looking at her and then we look and see what she's writing and she's writing, thank you, Mrs. Wolf and Mrs. Fackman. So that was something that really warmed my heart and I really cherished that. Another time was um, right at the, one point in the pirate games we had a group that actually had finished all of the different tasks that they were supposed to finish and they were the very first group so the bell starts ringing off and we're all and I tell them I was like 
group um crew blank i think 10 i think they were crew 10 has come finally completed all of the tasks they are now ready to find their treasure and it was a burst of like clapping and cheering and yeah go and they were like so they were so great and like pushing each other and cheering for each other and congratulating each other. I think that's one of my favorites. Okay, no, I have another one and just thought of it too. So there was a morning meeting where I did a question of um, if we had a classroom playlist, like for songs, what song would you put on it? So we were reading all these songs out and during my morning meeting, I always go back during that, that's kind of our share. So I would go back and start reading some of our whiteboard messages and uh, there were all these songs. So I would start to say a song and then everybody would start busting out dancing and singing to it. And then I would say another one and they would start dancing and singing to it. And that is just, that is the coolest feeling to have those kids just, I feel like they just love each other. Like it's just, there is that sense of community. Uh, and I have one more too. So I had another little girl who, uh, she was presenting her math um, project to the class during morning meeting and it was about place value. And so she's telling about place value, she did it in Brook Creator, she's going through it and in the very end of it she says, but they really couldn't remember all the rules so they decided to make a song. And she starts making up this song that she did in her Book Creator. And my partner teacher looks over to me and she says, that's all you. And I said, yeah, that's me, we're the singers. Woo! So those are just seeing that I am making some kind of a difference in their lives and how they're acting and how happy they are is those are great, great feelings. I had a lot of them. Sorry. Okay, so the second part to that question is, do you wish you were still a kindergarten teacher? Sometimes, I'm not gonna lie, sometimes I do. I miss some of the activities that I did in kindergarten. I miss the, how young they were and how much, like, they just loved you. No matter what, they loved you. Um, they thought that you were the best person ever. You were the greatest person to them. And I do, I miss that. And I miss the activities. I miss, I don't know. I miss it. I do miss it. Um, as far as going back to kindergarten, I don't know. Because I love fourth grade. There are things that I didn't like about kindergarten because it was a very exhausting, especially at the end of the year, or, you know, during the beginning of the year, well, actually the first like three or four months of the year. It's exhausting. Whereas like, there's just ups and downs with both of them. So... How do you like living in a new state and job? Um, okay, so it's cold outside. I'm not gonna lie, it is cold, and I had to shave ice off of my windshield the other day, and that was not a fun experience. But other than that, I'm loving it. It's beautiful here in Pennsylvania. Um, my kids are adjusting really, really great, which is, I think, the only thing that I was worried about. Um, my family is happy. If my family is happy, I don't care where we live, to be honest. Um, as far as the job goes, I love it. I'm loving fourth grade. The school that I work for is amazing. My administration is amazing. My partner teacher is probably one of the best that I could have ever asked for, ever. Um, so I'm having a great experience with moving from Alabama to Pennsylvania and you know having this huge adjustment with a new job and a new grade level. It's been really great so far. I've had my moments, but y'all, everybody's gonna have moments. We're all gonna have moments where you know, you're know you stressed out, you're crying, it's just gonna happen. I mean, we're women. And if you're not a woman and you're a man watching this, this is how women feel. <laughs> we cry for everything, I feel like, sorry. <laughs> okay, what, was the, what has been the biggest change from kindergarten to fourth grade? independence by like a landslide so uh, kindergarten it was I had to tie your shoes I had to show you how to unbuckle your pants I had to show you how to you know sit down I had to show you how to walk I had to show you how to open things how to everything here I can write a message they can read it and they can do it um, so independence is by far the biggest change from both of those 
and I love it. Like I absolutely love the independence. I love the fact that they can come in and I can say, please read that whiteboard because a lot of times they'll say, well, what do I do with this? Mm -mm. Please read the morning message. It's all in the morning message for you. And I can simply say that and then we're done with the conversation. Whereas for kindergarten, it was like, I had to help this friend. Oh, now I gotta go help this friend. Now I need to go and help this friend. So it was, all. it's, I don't feel like I'm like running around like a chicken with my head cut off as much as what I did in kindergarten. Okay, did your teen teacher also do Pirate Day or do you go about it on your own? Um, no. My partner teacher went all in with me. Um, she is just as crazy as I am, which is so fantastic. Um, we think very much alike. So she wanted to do something like this and I said, hey, let's do this and she was down for it. So um, I started planning it, kind of giving her my ideas of how I wanted to go about it and she jumped right in. I mean, so we did it together very much and she was a tremendous help. Um, she is a phenomenal teacher and I probably could not have done it without, without her because she is, she's fantastic. I love it. Um, and what ways activities do you work with her? So I had another question and let me see if I can find it and it says how does your school work with partner teacher and do you only teach one subject or does she teach the other or how does that work? So I think those are the same questions so I'm going to answer them both now. Um, I've had a lot of questions about my partner teacher and exactly how it all works. So here's how I like to think about it. Just like you would have a husband or a wife in life, like that's your partner in life, this is kind of my partner at school. Um, we literally do everything together. Um, so I teach ELA, which is reading and writing. She teaches math, science, and social studies. So she has one homeroom of 22 kids. I have one homeroom of 23 kids. But together we have 45 kids. We never say, oh, my kids are going to go to your class now, your kids are going to go to mine. It doesn't work that way. We say we have 45 kids together. We are like this group of 45 kids. We are all a family together. Um, and we kind of mixed them up and jumbled them up and said, okay, now this group is going to come to me during the morning time and you're going to go to Mrs. You know, my partner, ugh. you're going to go to me during the morning time. And then you're going to go to my partner teacher during the afternoon time and vice versa. So um, morning meetings, we do both together. So every morning I go to her classroom with all of my homeroom, we put all 45 kids together and we do morning meeting together to build that classroom community. Then I take my group of kids and I will teach that first morning class reading and writing. And then we have a, um, like a middle of the day, 40 minute block, which is like when which is what I need time and that's when they are working on some type of a choice calendar and then we're pulling kids for intervention slash um, conferences and then in the afternoon I take the second group and I teach reading and writing to them um, on Fridays we have something called stem during that win time in the middle of the day and we will put all 45 kids together again and we'll have this big stem activity that they'll complete so we literally do everything together but because I only teach two subjects my kids you know the group of kids that I have to that time will then go to her to get the other subjects that they need to get if that makes any sense. I'm hoping this is makes sense. So she is literally the person that I go to. We deal with behaviors together. We deal with parent conferences together. So when we do parent conferences, we're going to do them together. When we make phone calls, we do that together. When we send out emails, we make sure everything that's put in there, I check to say, hey, do you want to add something into this email? I'm about to send it out to parents. She'll tell me that. We split some of the work. It's phenomenal it is the best thing ever and really the reason why I think it is the best thing ever is because I found the teacher that is so perfect for me like me and her we just click together our personalities match um, are very much alike the way we teach is very much alike so we are I don't know we, we fit really well together um, which is a blessing it's really phenomenal. I absolutely love it. So I hope that makes sense. I only teach reading and writing. She teaches the other subjects. We kind of 
jumble all of our kids up and then put them off into two groups, a morning group and an afternoon group, and they just switch throughout the day. So um, that's pretty much how it works. But it's great because we do everything else together. You don't really have to do it alone. Um, and that's, I think, probably one of the best parts about it. Okay, so this is my last question, and it's can you share some tips on how you balance work life and family life? Um, I think, and this is that in that teach.com video, I think I talked about this a little bit too, and I think I pretty much remember me saying I don't. <laughs> there's no on there's no way that I feel like I've ever really truly balanced everything perfectly. Um, I try to say that, you know, I try to tell myself to leave by five o'clock and go pick up my younger son at daycare, go home, have dinner, you know, spend a little bit of time and then hopefully when the kids go to bed or they're getting ready to go to bed, I could do maybe an hour or so of work. Um, I try to make sure that we're doing some family fun activities on the weekends that I'm not, what the beauty is, is I can't really go to, I can't go to school because it's locked. So I spend pretty much my entire weekends work playing and hanging out with my family. So. Um, it's hard. It's, it is very hard. I feel like you have to figure out a rhythm. You have to figure out when to get certain things done, where you're wasting time and what you should be doing instead of wasting some of that time. So like in the afternoons, I know that to make myself feel better, you know, in the afternoons at school and work, I have to get certain things finished, accomplished on my checklist. If those things are done for tomorrow, then I'm not stressed out. I don't have to worry about anything. I know that if I am, it's getting close to like Wednesday, I need to start looking at what it is that I need to have copied for the next week have that done so then again I'm not having to do a lot of it later on. Um, I feel like also working with other teachers, splitting some of that workload. I have some other really phenomenal ELA teachers within my building that we are working on a, on a big unit together. So we kind of share some of that workload so I'm not having to do so so much. Um, and I will say that with being in fourth grade I don't feel like I'm doing as much at home as what I did in kindergarten. So it's a huge difference because in kindergarten, you know, you had a lot of cutting for them. You had a lot of different activities. Fourth grade, it's it's just different. I don't, I wish I could say more, but there's just, you know, they're reading more independently. You wanna just give them opportunities to read. That's probably one of my big struggles right now is just saying, hey, all I want you to do is read. I don't wanna give you a ton of activities. I don't want you going out and doing a ton of stuff. I want you sitting out there and I want you using this time to read. So. I don't give them a ton of other things, so a lot of the things that I'm doing, I can get it done at school or I finish it within that first like hour or two hours that I have each night to complete some of my work. But um, I just learned to tell myself, hey, you know what, I gotta turn it off, I gotta turn it off. It's gonna get done. And I promise you, like, <laughs> and I even told my partner teacher this, I was like, don't be stressed out. Like, it's gonna eventually get done. One way or another, it always happens. It has always happened that I always get everything done, and I don't know how. I don't know how it happens, but it does. So I try not to stress myself out about it. Um, making lists is a big part of my life, making sure I'm checking off some of those things that are on my list, um, and then using my time wisely. So instead of going to the um, faculty lounge and sitting down with everybody, I'm working through lunch. So I try to use my time wisely when I'm at school so that I'm not just kind of not doing anything, but I'm getting some of my work accomplished and I don't have to take that home. But I hope that helps. I could do more videos on that. I may have to think about that though. So if you wanted to see more on that, let me know. But this is the end of my Q&A. Um, I will try to do more Q&As later on in the future. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe, share it out, and I will talk to you guys really, really soon.